aren't you glad for such a blood? You can have confidence in today and know without a shadow of a doubt it hadn't lost one bit of its power. Amen. And even Brother Branham told us, he said, take a look even at the morning star. See how it glistens and it shines and it shouts. And he said, it hadn't lost one ray of its glory. And he said, what about a believer? Amen. You're not going to diminish and fall away. Lose all your glory. Oh, no. We are morning stars to shine forth the light of Jesus Christ to a darkened world. We're not getting less and less. We're getting greater and greater. We're not getting weaker and weaker. We're getting more powerful and more powerful. We're morning stars. Shine, morning stars. Herald the coming of the day. We are here in the hour for it, the day and the hour of our Lord's return. And we want to thank God for his goodness and his love and mercy to us. Amen. What a wonderful Savior that he is. I was just thinking, as you have gathered and enjoyed this meeting together with us, I was thinking about the many that here of the church home folks that has worked together to try to get you meals together and try to help out in different ways, um, help me with the ministry in my, in my home. And, you know, I'm not much of a cook, and my cook went to heaven. So um, some of these earthly cooks have kind of picked up the, the slack and helped me out, and I certainly appreciate that. I want to just tell the home folks, you make me proud. Amen. God bless you, each one of you. And we want to just say thank you for all of you that have come and been made this meeting a part of what it is. Each one of you bringing your lick of fire for the wonderful ministry. We'll have Brother Donnie Reagan that will be capping this service off by the power of the Holy Spirit today. But as I, I thought about what we are identified with, I can hear Brother Branham say this and it just rung in my heart. He said, I was surely identified with him in his death. And I was identified on the first Easter I raised with him from death, identified with him in his death. I was with the 120 in the upper room. I was identified with them. Hey, I feel religious. Oh, my, I was identified there. I was one of them. I was identified. I got the same experience they had. I was there when it happened to be a true Christian. I witnessed the mighty Russian wind coming. I witnessed that. I felt the power of God as it shook. I was with them that spoke in tongues. I felt the anointing come in there. I was with them. I was identified with them when the Holy Ghost began to speak through tongues with them. I was with Peter before the critics in Acts 2 when he preached that great sermon that he did. I was identified with them, and I, with him. Yes, sir, in Acts 4 when they assembled together, I was with them when the building shook. And after the prayer meeting, the building shook where they were sitting and, and uh, were identified with them. And then he speaks of Ma Paul on Mars Hill and, and John on the Isle of Patmos and Luther and Wesley. But then he said, I'm here in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, identified with the same kind of group, with the same kind of an experience. I must be to be a Christian. I must, be, I must stay identified where the Word of God is being manifested. I'm identified with a group that feels the Spirit of God. I am identified with a group that knows He's unveiled, that knows He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and knows that this is not fanaticism. It is Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Oh, they're called a bunch of heretics. Yet a bunch of fanatics on account of word, but I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God into salvation. And I'm one, I'm one of them living epistles that I spoke of vindicated God veiled in human form and men and women. God in Morphe again. The great king laid aside his glory, said, Yet a little while the world has seen me no more, but I'll be veiled in them. You'll see me because I'll be in you. Amen. Oh, my, that's where we are today. Identified. 
with a group of people that still believes he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Knows what it feels like. Has experienced the power of God in their lives. Know the change that has taken place. You can't, your argument can't take them out. Debate will never take it out of them. It's sealed in there because they met God themselves and no argument can take that away. Amen. Aren't you glad to be identified with him this morning? God bless you. Amen. Thank you for coming and being a part of this meeting. We want to pray for Wanda Underwood that is on a ventilator, a ventilator at Vanderbilt. She's not fully conscious. She needs the Lord to intervene. intervene. She needs to wake up. There's also a sister, Kathy Guest. She has numbness in her feet after the COVID. And then, then, then there was a request there that came in from some that were seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I just want to say to you, um, this is for Isabella and um, Natalia, that are Natalia. They're seeking the baptism and, and uh, been having a lot of trials since they started it, started seeking for it. But I just tell you, if you hunger and you thirst for righteousness, you shall be filled. That's God's promise to you. And the promise is to you and to your children. And I don't care how far off in sin you've been, as many as the Lord our God shall call, and he's still calling. I'll tell you, if I were you, I would knock and I would keep on knocking. I would ask and keep on asking. I would not give up until I surrendered everything to receive what he promised for me. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we didn't ask for hands to go up, but I know you know the hearts of the many here today that would say, Jesus, pass by my way. Lord, we have read these requests and some seeking the Holy Ghost and it's promised for them. Lord, some that are desiring healing after COVID. And Lord, I, I pray God you'll meet that need for our sister and the others that are desiring the same. And Father, for all these other situations, Lord, a, a little sister on the ventilator needs to wake up. You're the resurrection and the life. There is nothing too hard for the Lord. I pray, God, your Holy Spirit will hover over that bedside. Lord, and breathe life into her. The change will begin immediately, Lord, and a deliverance be wrought. We give every part of this service now into your hands and ask that you would minister us through the word, Lord, as we worship you together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. How many is glad you can say you're one of them? Amen. Let's sing this together. Amen. I'm one of them. I'm one of them. Well, I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them. I'm one of them. I'm one of them. were gathered in the upper room they were gathered in the upper room praying in his name they were baptized with the holy ghost power for service came now what he did for them that day before you the same so glad that i can say i'm one of them i'm 
Just turn around, greet your neighbor. Amen. Welcome each other to the house of the Lord. Ask the brothers they would to take up the offering to this morning to give unto the Lord. Some glad morning we shall see Jesus in the air. Heaven's Jubilee. Amen. Some glad morning we shall see Jesus in the air. Coming after you and me, joy is ours to share. Sister Mandy Ron Colley to come with her special this morning. Let's sing that last verse again. The chorus. And when with all the heavenly host we begin to sing, singing in the Holy Ghost, how the heavens will reign. Millions there will join that song. With them we shall be praising Christ through ages long. Heaven's jubilee. And oh, what singing, oh, what shouting, on that happy morning when we all shall rise. Oh, what glory, hallelujah, when we meet our blessed Savior in the sky.
silent surely it was through since when has impossible ever stopped you Friday's disappointment is Sunday's empty too since when has impossible ever stopped you This is the sound of dry bones rattling. This is the praise make a dead man walk again. Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm going to live, going to live again. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. Damn me. Sister Bethany, well, they got Lawson wrote down here. 
I believe it's Hatfield now. Amen. So we're going to ask her to come and get ready to sing. And right after she's through, Brother Benoit, if you'd sing for us. Amen. Amen. Let's just sing, I will praise the Lord. Oh, I will praise the Lord.
it's a good thing I can't sing like that. I'd sing all day. Amen. 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 What a privilege it's been to be able to be together. Amen. So appreciate the minister and brethren that's, that's been here with us. And appreciate the host pastor, Brother Tim, and the, all the deacons and all the lay folks that have done everything that you've done to make the meetings a success. We're so grateful for the presence of the Lord. Wouldn't it be sad if we had gathered like this and we were gathered under some denominational auspices or we'd gathered to rally around one person or one theory or one doctrine. But we've come that we might be able to worship the Lord and hear His Word and have Him to change our lives. I don't know about you, I didn't just come to be blessed while I'm here. I'm going to take something home with me. It'll make me a better, a better person. It's been such an honor to be here. God bless you. Turn with me today to the book of Matthew chapter 17, verse 1. Matthew chapter 17, verse 1. We'll read um, through verses 5, if you would. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with them, then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. How many like to be remembered today as we Amen. pray? Let's bow our heads together if you would. Lord Jesus, it's with joy and sadness too that we come to the last service of this special time. We so enjoyed your presence, enjoyed the word the ministry of the brothers. Enjoy the fellowship of the one another, the songs. It's been an awesome time. And yet, many of us will head toward home today. We'll go our separate ways. But it reminds us that one day we will have a great gathering. And we will never have to say goodbye. Hasten that day, Lord Jesus. Help me, I pray, to be able to get out of the way, Father. That you can speak through me something that will be an encouragement, a help to your people. Only you can take a service and be able to custom fit it so every hungry heart will get something. I cannot do that, Lord, nor could any other man. But it's simply in your hands. So we commit ourselves to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. And the saint said, Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you. I thought that I was uh, ready for today. I've studied several things and looked at several things. And uh, Caroline went back to our place last night and uh, I studied again and again. And I was convinced I knew which way I needed to go. But this morning before daylight, the presence of God came in where I was and woke me up and he began to deal with me about what I wish to speak to you about today. And I want to use three words, going back home, going back home. And first of all, let me say that uh, whenever I or my my friends, my brothers here sitting behind me stand and 
say it's an honor to be able to be with the bride and speak to the bride. That's not just words. That's not cliches. It's not just something nice to say. But we really mean that with all of our hearts. I counted such an honor and a privilege, no matter where I've been around the world, to speak to the bride of Christ. It is the highest honor of my life. I was raised in Kentucky, just a little hillbilly boy. I never thought I'd probably ever even leave the state. Going to school, I didn't have any friends. I was saved when I was 12 years old. Most of the boys heckled me at school all the time, ridiculed me, made fun of me, laughed at me. They'd bring pornographic magazines to school, and I would cover my eyes, and they would knock me down on the, uh, the parking lot at school, and they would tear my hands away from my face, and I would close my eyes, and they'd take their fingers and open my eyelids and try to make me look at things that was, I knew was not right. So the most of my life, I wanted friends, friends, you know, real friends. And whenever the Lord uh, brought me to himself and his grace and then allowed me to be able to stand with what I consider to be some of the greatest men of God alive today. <clears throat> it, And I don't limit it just to these few brothers that are here, but brothers of like precious faith around the world. So it has been one of the honors of my life to be able to stand and speak to the Queen of Heaven. And looking at that, I realize that speaking words, most of us preachers that have done it for very long, I just turned 65 in July, and I've been preaching since I was 18. Brother Tim's been preaching longer than I have, some of these brothers here uh, Brother Kenny, no doubt, more longer than I have, but you do learn how to talk a little bit anyway after all of those years. But you realize it's not what you can say. It's not just being able to get words that you think would be a benefit, but it's following the Spirit of God and following exactly what He knows that we all need. And our, our setting today is one of a great paradox. In, in our minds, it's probably hard for us to comprehend what it must have been like on this great mountaintop experience. After six days, when the Lord Jesus called three of his closest disciples, they were of the intimate circle, and he calls them up with them, and there they go into the presence of God. And Matthew said he was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun. And his raiment was white as the light. Now that within itself would have been a phenomenal visitation. But then comes Moses and Elias, and they are talking with him. How we love mountaintop experiences. Don't you love them? Don't you so love when you are soaring in heavenly places in Christ Jesus? And this must have been one of the highlights. Years and years later, as Peter is writing his epistle, and he says that they were up on the Holy Mount, and he, he words it the way that he, the, the, you remember the reading in the Scripture, beautifully, the way he was able to capture it. And you can tell the impact of that, he never got over it. No doubt John never got over it again. Whenever he was there on the Isle of Patmos, it was something that so marked their lives. And yet, we know that God never ordained that his people would live on these type of mountains every day of their life. Now, we have these meetings and we call them special meetings. And they are. They are special. Yet, we realize that every time we come to the house of God, it should be special. Is that right? It should be special. Now here, the Lord willing, Wednesday night, Evening Light Tabernacle, they will gather together again. And I'm not sure who's going to be preaching Wednesday, who the special singers will be. But yet, we know, those of you that have streamed any of these services just from the local assembly, you know that this is a great church. Have a great ministry, great music, great singers. It's just a great place. That's all there is to it. But yet, really, part of what makes this meeting special, too, is because you visitors are here as well. So special meetings aren't just that, well, Evening Light Tabernacle hosted this, and they are such a special people and such a special ministry and such special music and special, special, special. So whenever we go home, we go back to our churches, and we don't have that special. No, actually, that's not the way that it is. 
Actually, each one of you visitors have, had, have helped make this a special meeting. Is that right? Each one of these speakers that have come, those of you that have driven and spent part of your livelihood, you have made that a special thing. But there's something about us as human beings that we love special things in our lives. And there's special places that we all like to eat. And there's special things that we like to do. And there's, let's just be honest, there's preachers that we like to hear that seem to minister to us in a special way. It's not that we really love them any more than others. But God has somehow connected us with their gift. And they just seem to minister to us in such a way, well, it's just beyond our explanation really. And they will always have a special place in our hearts. Is that right? Now, that's, that's just being honest today. There are special things that God gives us. Each of us have had special experiences with God. Some of them we can share. Some of them we cannot share. They are given to us just between us and our Master. So there's something about us that we have an inclination to lean towards special things, special occasions, special people, special mountaintop experiences. Oh, but alas, we know that even with the life of the Lord Jesus, after he left this great place of this mountaintop experience, and what a life-changing thing that this must have been. But yet, whenever he comes down from the mountain, from walking in this great thing, and it was a prefigure of the great body change that he was going to have. Actually, the Lord Jesus allowed his body to experience what it was going to be like when he raised from the dead on that third morning. Now think, he, Elijah and Moses appear as well, and here we see a glimpse of the future kingdom. We see the glorified Son of God, we see the resurrected dead, we see the transfigured dead, and then we see the mountain, those men there on the mountain, and then at the bottom of the mountain we see people outside of the kingdom gates that didn't, didn't even have an idea what was going on. So it was a prefigure of the glory of God. Now you think, after something that great happened, could there ever be any trials after that? Could there ever be any hardships after that? Now, oh my, how we have fed this week on the Word, how we have rejoiced in the presence of God. Some of you probably ain't stood in church this long, and God only knows how long. You couldn't even sit down. You were so caught up in the presence of God. It was awesome, was it not? Amen. But after today, we're going back home. Now, I guess the important thing that I would like to ask you about it is, what are you going to take back home with you? Now, while I've been here, I've had an older sister in my church to pass away. Within 30 minutes or so, her daughter passed away. I have a double funeral to do on Tuesday night. Uh, am I going to leave and preach that funeral all elated and jumping up and down the way I was here Friday night? Probably not. Am I going to be so carried away with what I received and I'll go grab that family and tell them, oh, you ought to have been in Louisiana. Oh, hallelujah to God. Glory to God. No, their hearts are so broken. Now, can you imagine losing a mother and a sister within 30 minutes' time? You see, the great mountaintop places that God allows us to have are many times preparing us for the week's that will follow. Now, I know we don't like to hear this, and believe me, I didn't want to preach it, but I've learned to follow my boss. He's got great plans and great benefits, but if you don't obey him, his hand can really hurt when he whoops you. So I've learned a long time ago it's best to follow him. Some of you, no doubt, have come to this meeting, and you came with great burdens. You left a husband at home that was not where he needed to be with God. 
You left with issues on your job. You left with issues in your church. You left with family problems, marital problems. And although you have got touched and helped and ministered to, no doubt some of you, when you go back home, those problems will still be there. And the truth of it is, there may be more once you get back home. So what are we going to take with us when we go back home? What are these meetings going to benefit us as the people of God? So are we going to lose our joy? Are we going to lose our ability to stand and tell that preacher, seek him, boy, seek him? Are you going to be so sad when you go to your church Wednesday night that the preacher can't even get an amen out of you? You know, I find that many times people, they look at their own home church and they say, our church ain't nothing. But we we don't do this at our church and we don't do that at our church. And oh my, people come to a meeting like this where a host church is hosting a great meeting. Many folks want to go home and pack everything they've got and move to that church because they think that's the normal, every, every church service. Well, let me just give you a rude awakening. That is not the way it is. Hallelujah. You see what you got me into, sir? They were shouting last night. Now they're pouting. Now you see, people think that that atmosphere is, is allowed to be there. No, 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 friend. Now I'm not saying that even in my tabernacle, they have tremendous services, regular services, tremendous. But there's something special about special meetings. And yet the people many times that will attend them, then they go home. Today, Brother Andrew Glover will be preaching at Happy Valley. But Andrew Glover will be missing part of Happy Valley's Amen Corner. You know why? They're here. Part of the people who would have normally pulled on Brother Andrew are not there today. They're sitting over here, they're sitting over here, they're sitting in different spots. One thing that makes a meeting like this its so paramount is each of you bringing your lick of fire with it. And bringing it together and our expectation, my, you could feel it from the very first night. The expectation of the people of God was so high. I just wonder how it'd be if we do that in normal services at home. But you see, there's something about these mountaintop experiences. Oh, my, we love them. Notice in Luke chapter 9, as Luke catches this and he writes about it, and he said, And it came to pass that on the next day when they were come down from the hill, much people met him. Uh Uh-oh. Now he had Peter, James, and John. They were select men. They were men that loved God. They loved supernatural experiences. So the very next day after transfiguration, you go to meeting people. And if you've got people, you've got problems. You got a big church, got big problems. Got a little church, still got big problems. (laughs) Now notice the very next day. And behold, a man of the company cried out, saying, Master, I beseech thee, look upon my son, for he is my only son, and lo, a spirit taketh him, and he suddenly crieth out, and it tareth him that he foameth, notice this again, and bruising him, hardly departeth from him. And I besought thy disciples to cast him out, and they could not. So here the Lord Jesus, after soaring into this great dimension of God is met with much people. Much people has many needs, of course. 
Here he comes with this poor man bringing his son and he's so demon possessed that the young man is foaming at the mouth and the spirit tears him and oh, it must have been horrible. And he brings him to the disciples. Now, these are the future men of the message. They're the men that's going to propagate this message and carry it on. So the Lord Jesus comes straight off the mountain, and he hears that some of his men have now failed one of the first tasks. So after this great mountaintop experience, he's hit immediately with the needs of the people and he's also hit with the failures of those who are the future work of the extension of his ministry right after a mountaintop experience. Now you can take this the way you want to. I believe with all of my heart, Almighty God is speaking to somebody here today. Well, to be honest with you, it's more than one somebody. But remember, when difficult times come, we don't want to throw everything that we have got, all the blessings, all the encouragement, all the joy, all the elevation and the presence of God and just lay it aside and say, what good did it do me to even go to that meeting? He's saying, well, if it hadn't been for that, where would I have been when this hard time hit me? Oh, my. Notice this. Jesus answering said, Oh, faithless and perverse generation, straight from transfiguration to faithless and perverse. Oh, my goodness. Guess what, friends? We're all heading home. Where was Jesus? Home. Now, as much as transfiguration was a wonderful thing, this was what he experienced, of course. This was the type of glory that he said, Father, I desire to have the glory that I had with thee before the world was. So this was what he experienced before the Logos became a man. But since he'd been now a man for all of these 30 years, this was now home. So home was what? Dealing with people that were demon-possessed. Home was now dealing with people that fell short of the glory of God. Home was now people that constantly had in needs and troubles and heartaches and difficulties. And Jesus had to come down off of the mountain and go back home. Oh, aren't you glad that he did? Now, what if he would have said, hey, you know what? I love this so well. I I, I really don't want to go back home. I honestly don't want to leave this Shekinah because I've been out of it now for 30 years. I I don't want to go out of this anymore. I love this. This is where I came from. So Peter, James, and John, go ahead and go back down. Y'all go back down. And y'all just do the best you can and just barely hang on or whatever you can do. I ain't going back. I'm sorry. I am not going back. I'm so glad he did. Because he had not died yet. He had not given his blood. Hallelujah, what is transfiguration doing? It is preparing him for Calvary. It is preparing him for death and for his resurrection. Hallelujah. Notice in Luke chapter nine, verse 46. And then there arose a reasoning Among them, which of them should be the greatest? Wow. (laughs) Wonderful. No doubt he said, I'm back home. (laughs) I'm back home. Now here, he already had some disappointment because disciples couldn't cast out this devil. And then they begin to argue among themselves. I believe I'm the best preacher. There's more people stream my services than yours, ain't there? How many of you got streaming yours on YouTube anyway? Well, I think there's more people at our church. Well, I, I tell you what, when I got up to sing a special song, I believe people clap 13 seconds longer for me than they did when you sang it. Yeah, we're home. Come on, friends, we're still human beings. We're still human beings. We 
Would you care to finish this? <laughs> I'm at home, huh? Oh, man. I don't know why I get asked to take the last service of these meetings anyway. <laughs> and then there arose a reasoning among them which of them should be greatest. And Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a child and set him by him. And he said unto them, Whosoever shall receive this child in my name, receiveth me. And whosoever shall receive me, receiveth him that sent me. For he that is least among you all, the same shall be great. Can you imagine coming from having your body changed? A temporary resurrection. A glorification of the presence of God and you come straight from that just a day before and you've got people arguing about, I'm gonna be bigger than you are. Why, you are not. You've got a big, long, ugly nose. Nobody ain't gonna like you. Why, you don't do this and you don't, don't tell me. I'll tell you one thing. They like hearing me preach better than that. Don't sit there and look at me like that. Don't go on amongst the preachers. It goes on among singers. It goes on amongst musicians. Why? Because it is home. Can't you see, friend? The reason we need a body change is not just to make us all young again. We don't need to just be young again. We have to be changed. Our bodies, this part of us must be changed. Oh, not you, John. Not you. And John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him because he wasn't at the meetings in Louisiana. <laughs> He's not part of our clique. All of this after transfiguration. My goodness, some of y'all are going to be dragging your tracks in, aren't you? Oh, dear God, I don't want to go home. <laughs> some of y'all just extended your vacation for another week, didn't you? They're going to be here Wednesday night. <laughs> I think me and Carol will stay. <laughs> Why? Because we don't like trouble. Look, friends, if you're born again, it is your nature to love peace. You think these men love to preach hard? You see, any God-called man loves to preach hard, and whenever God goes to the demons, you say, no, Lord, no, I don't want to preach that. I don't want to go that way. Why? We love peace. And yet we are some of the most profound warriors that's ever been on the earth. How do peacemakers become professional fighters? It's because that dual nature inside of us. We are called to withstand evil. We are called to preach the word. We're called to help the children of God. And yet we love peace. We love it. John, the beloved disciple, that leaned over on Jesus' chest. One of the most intimate places. And it was given to John. But look at John's makeup. John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name. We forbade him because he followeth not with us. Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not. For he that is not against us is for us. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him. Because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, here we go with blessed little John again. 
saw this, they said, Lord, will thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? You want a scripture? Even as Elijah did. Straight after transfiguration. I got to be honest with you, I don't think I'd ever even realize all this happened after transfiguration until before daylight this morning. <laughs> That's the way the Lord does, though, isn't it? But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. John, John, one of the ones who was there. Look at Peter. Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let's build three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Let's just stay here. That's us, ain't it? Praise God. Let's all move to Brother Tim's church. What do you say? I'll call home and I'll get a bunch of U-Hauls and we'll all move here. He's in the office now saying, dear God, no. Oh, my goodness. So what are you folks that are visitors here? What are you going to take from these meetings when you go to your home church Wednesday night? And next weekend? You know, many folks, and it goes in our, around our message that many live from special meeting to special meeting to special meeting to special meeting. And if you're not careful, our youth can do the exact same thing. They go from one youth meeting to another to another to another. And then you see some of them same youth in their home church. They don't even raise their hands. They don't stand up. You can't hardly get them to do anything. Well, come on now, saints. Why? They jump from mountain to mountain to mountain to mountain. And is that really what we're trying to build in the message? Is that what God wants us to be? Look at these guys the way they were. And we know the reason that they did this. They was not born again. Oh, my. They did not have the Holy Ghost yet. So do we want, whether it's young or old, do we want to just live from special meeting to special meeting to great climax after another climax? No, friend, that's not what God wants us to be, but take what you've got. Oh, but Brother Donnie, my church, they don't jump and they don't shout. Well, take what you've got, and if you've got something genuine, maybe it'll break out among them. Well, praise the Lord. Remember, Brother Branham says revival is not you and your church. It's you. It's you. As long as you've got a Holy Ghost revival, whether nobody else there wants it or not, you're going to have revival because you're drinking from the water of life. Going back home. Some of y'all driving? Some of y'all flying. Brother David told me he's leaving out this afternoon out of Shreveport flying, going to Atlanta, from Atlanta to Geneva, I think you told me. Amsterdam, then Geneva. Oh, I know Brother David well enough to know. He's going to be packing some of this home. And whenever he preaches again there in his congregation, you'll be able to see a little bit of Louisiana anointing on him. You're going to be able to see a little bit of Louisiana influence on him. Why? Because he's going to take what he received from the mountaintop experience, will he have problems and troubles? No doubt he will. But is he going to let them get him down? Absolutely not. He's going to say, I went there, I received, and I brought it back with me. Praise God. I didn't just bring souvenirs from the U.S., but I brought a new, fresh anointing. Amen. That's what you want to do. You don't want to just take some souvenirs from Louisiana, but you want to take a refreshing from the presence of the Lord. And when Satan meets you, you say, back off, devil. Hallelujah. Back off, devil. I receive the freshness from the presence of my Lord.
going back home. Exodus chapter 32, verse 10. And Moses turned and went down from the mount. And the two tables of testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides. The one on the one side and the one on the other were written. And the tables were the work of God. Listen now. The work of God and the writing. So just in case some of you all think you had the first tablet, Moses used a tablet. (laughs) There's no way we can imagine what that must have been like. To watch God take his finger. He probably wasn't left-handed the way I am, but (laughs) God in a form of humanity Right on this. It must have been so sacred, so holy, so awesome. You know the story. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, it is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. Joshua heard one thing. The prophet of the age heard something else. And it came to pass as soon as he came nigh to the camp that he saw the calf. What? The prophet is in the mountain of God with a mountaintop experience receiving the law of God written by the very finger of God and they're down there worshiping around the calf. And they were naked. Dancing, shouting, hollering, screaming. Well, that works on a pastor's attitude. I want you to notice now. It came to pass as soon as he came down to the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moses' anger waxed hot. And he cast the tables out of his hands and break them. Beneath the mount. What in the world would cause a man of God to take the only inscription that God had ever written with his own finger? What caused it? Back home. You see, God meant for Moses to visit the mountain, but he didn't tell him to pack his suitcase and move up there. Don't you understand why we're going to love heaven so much? We get to pack our stuff and go away. (laughs) No more carnality. No more fallen humanity. No more trouble. No more heartaches. No more difficulty. We get to pack our soul with the goodness of God and leave our humanity, oh my, that was born of such desire behind and get a glorious body like unto his glorious body. Fare ye well, fare ye well. Friends, let's just be honest. Unless we're changed, Unless we are so changed to the core, heaven would not be a really nice place to live in. Because some of you would want to live in a certain section. And you wouldn't want to get out of that section. You'd want to go to this certain spot and there'd be neighbors that have tempers. and this. There'll be none of that there that day. Why? Because we will all be changed. Not just new, but changed. Change your humanity. Brother Ron mentioned it last night. It's so stinking rotten humanity that we deal with every day of our life. I know we don't like to hear it quoted, but Brother Branham said his worst enemy was William Branham. I wonder how God feels about it when we idolize the prophet's greatest enemy. We idolize his flesh. We worship him. Many of the message people do. They idolize his humanity and make him like God. And he said that was his greatest enemy. You might as well go ahead and say amen. Your greatest enemy is not your wife. It's not your husband. Come on, preach with me now. It's not your little boy. It's not your little girl. Your greatest enemy is yourself. You are the one that gets in your way. You are the one, the reason you're not any closer to God today. Oh, 
Mama. You imagine him saying, God, do I have to go back home? I love being here. This is so awesome. Could you do that again? Could you just let me watch you write? I'm not the first man that's ever on the earth, but none of them ever saw you write before. Nobody's ever seen this exceeding great glory. Moses entered into that pillar of fire. The prophet said, become God when he come out. Can you imagine? He was so changed. They had to put a veil over the man's face because the Shekinah of God was all over him. In one minute, Shekinah was there. In the next, anger. And it wasn't God, and it wasn't cherubims, and it wasn't angels, and it wasn't zooms and seraphims that brought out the human agitation. It was his people. Oh, Jesus. People have that about them. Now, for the next few minutes, everybody can remain silent. You don't have to raise your hand. No smiling, no frowning, no moving, so you won't tell on yourself. But no doubt there are people here, or there's probably some streaming. That's what it is. That's why God had me to preach this. And you poor little sweet darlings are having to sit here and listen. I know what it is. Happy Valley's an hour ahead of this. They have finished listening to Brother Andrew and there's some sorry person there at Happy Valley that needs to hear this sermon and God made me preach it for them and you poor little darlings are having to listen to it. Everybody that believes that, stand on your head and gargle peanut butter. Come on, friends, let's be honest. We need help. We need help. It's our humanity that clashes. How many of you have people at work and they know how to push your buttons? Or there's people you go to church with. Dear God, I'm gonna step outside and say the rest of it. Or there's people you're married to. Well, praise the Lord. Everybody just act like nobody knows what we're talking about. Okay, not a way. We've got this. We've got this. Yeah, we got it all right. Right between the eyes. But don't you understand? Sometimes God allows those people in our lives to show us ourselves. I used to think God would let people come to my church so I could help them. I could really help them. But after several hundred, I began to wonder if maybe God hadn't sent them so I could be helped. (laughs) Oh my, how we love Maytag Christians as pastors. Boy, you just install them, get them saved, fill with the Holy Ghost, hook them up. They're there for 45 years. They never cause an issue. They never cause a problem. They're there Wednesday, Sunday. They pay their tithes. They're there. Anybody, you need to do this or that. They're there. Boy, whatever it is, they just chugga, 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 chugga. Man, they're faithful. They're praying for you. They don't have an old critical spirit on them. Every pastor ought to have at least one of them in a church. <laughs> You got more than one. You're really blessed. (laughs) But the truth of it is, when God saves us and fills us with the Holy Ghost, we're not automatic made tag, are we? But a belt will break, and a wheel will slip, and a cog will go bad, and an electronic gadget will mess up. It's not a marvel to me that I could love the Lord God. My marvel is how he could love me. And all my humanity, all of my mistakes. Come on, that children. Oh, don't you appreciate his love for you? 
I never, I was, wasn't a, a sinner the way some of you were a sinner and never drank, never smoked, never cussed, never run around, never done any of that. Give my heart to the Lord whenever I was just a young boy. But the Lord has had to deal with me much longer after I got saved than the years before I got saved. And what have I done for him? Well, it looks like I've hardly done anything. But yet I look at myself and I think, God, please help me. How can you be so merciful and so long-suffering? Remember, the Bible tells us as the people of God, when Peter wrote about the seven virtues that was to be manifested down through the seven church ages, and the last one that he wrote about was the one that sits right beneath the capstone, which is brotherly kindness. Now, don't let that scare you. That's a scarecrow that's been put up before the message, people, but it should scare crows and not eagles. That's right. Brotherly kindness is something that the prophet said must be added to the church. I hope you understand that he said the faith of Jesus Christ, the virtue of Jesus Christ, the knowledge of Jesus Christ, right on down to the very end to where he said the brotherly kindness of Jesus Christ. You think, why would the Lord Jesus need that? Don't you understand why that we need a high priest which can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities? I'm so glad today that we still have a high priest on the throne of God that can understand our humanity. He understands our humanity. The Lord Jesus himself understood what it was like to be a human. I'm so glad today that he's still there on the right hand of the throne of God to intercede for our humanity. And we say, Lord, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. Oh, God, we have not a great angelic being sitting there, but we have a glorified human body. Oh, hallelujah, a glorified human body that can remember his own humanity. He can remember weakness. He can remember pain. He can remember heartaches and sadness and disappointment. That's your high priest, not an angel, not Gabriel, not Wormwood. Oh, my. Paul said there's one mediator between God and man. The man, the man, Christ Jesus. After God spared Isaac on Mount Moriah, the great supernatural experience that God made known to Abraham, and he revealed himself as Jehovah Jireh, What a phenomenal thing. God created a ram. And the Bible says that the ram was caught in the thicket by his horns. So the ram, of course, was Ares, type of Christ. He was caught in the thicket. A thicket is the briars, thorns, the brambles, the things that have roots in the earth. So the ram was caught by a plant which was attached to the earth. You. You. Me. We're what caught the ram. We caught the ram. What is the horns? The prophet said a symbol of his power. We caught the ram and held him because we needed a kinsman redeemer. I don't know if you've ever noticed this or not, but the very next chapter, verse 1, the next written word of the further part of Abraham's history is this. And Sarah was 107 and 20 years old. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died in Kirjath Arba, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. So after this mountaintop experience, his dear beloved Sarah dies. Friends, you know it as well as I do. There are things about the will of God that can be so painful. You remember the prophet saying, I think it was 1951 in one of the life stories, and he said, Father, You have broken my heart over 
and over again. But I thank you for it. The will of God can be so painful. When God will take a loved one out of your life, a child, a wife, a husband, or a dear friend, whatever it is, and you say, oh God, no, 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 God, don't do it. Please, God, I beg you. And God takes them anyway. You say, God, why would you do that? His will can be so painful. And yet we believe it's perfect. Do we not? All these things that come after great elevations in the presence of God. So yeah, Abraham walks off of that. But I wonder, Brother Ron, had God not revealed himself to Abraham in the form of Jehovah Jireh, how would Abraham have dealt with such a blow as this? Listen to the prophet as he says it this way in the wings of a dove. One time up in the mountains and watching an eagle and seeing him fly away. You know my story of it. I said, it's good to be here, Lord. Like Peter, we could build three tabernacles. But now watch him. But down at the foot of the mountain, the sick and the afflicted are waiting. The lost and the dying are waiting. So let's do what we can while it's day. And someday there will be the wings of a white eagle that will come down and bear us away. In this sermon, Brother Bram tells us, why would he wait to heal me being an old man? He's going through this cycle again. Every seven years, seven eights, he says, where I am right now, 56 years old. Every seven years, he would get this sickness in his body and this, his stomach. and All kinds of people would come up and be healed. All types of miracles would happen. And yet the prophet himself suffering. And he sees the last dove as he'd waited and waited and longed to see that dove. And in his mind, he thinks he's going to be healed. But actually, he's going to be healed of his humanity, not his stomach trouble. Little did he know that a little bit over a month from this time, he would be in a horrific automobile accident. Many bones in his body broken. His poor leg mangled and twisted around the steering column of his car. Twisted and broken. A horrible way to leave this world. Leaving the meetings at Shreveport, which was some of the paramount services of his ministry. And he thought within himself, Oh my, it's going to come again. I, this is going to happen. That's going to happen. Oh, it's laying right there. It was all right. So he come off of that mountain and went down into the valley of the shadow of death. So friends, what are you going to take home with you after the fall meetings of October 21. We've driven in, we've flown in, we've come from various places. We've looked forward to these meetings for months and months. Great anticipation. I don't know about you, I wasn't disappointed. Well, you may be after today. So when the last amen is said and the last song, you start filing out these doors. What are you going to take? What are you going to take as a souvenir? Maybe some of you said first time to lose anything. I want some of that Cajun food. What, what do they call them things? That, that the crawfish or something they eat down there, them bug looking things. I want to try some of that. What do they call that stuff? A touffee or something like that? Or them red beans and rice. Man, they tell me, oh yeah, they are good. But we want more than etouffee, don't we? We want to take something that our faith has risen to a new plateau. My, haven't these brothers done an outstanding job? Hallelujah. They have. They've done a wonderful job.
Brother Ron, I was sitting by talking in the office before we came out. I said, you can tell these meetings are so different than the last time when I was here a couple of years ago. Anyway, you can just catch the mind of God and the way he had the ministers to go. You know what did that? Your needs. Your needs. Not so much that they chose to go that way, but your needs dictated what they preached. And it shows where you are. It shows that many of you have been struggling It shows that many of you have been going through great traumatic times in your life. And God said, I want my sons to preach faith builders. I want my sons to preach things. I wanted to give my people something that when they leave and pull off of that parking lot, them devils are going to say, you better get out of their way. You better get out of their way. They've got something to take home with them. Hallelujah. They're going to have something to meet the enemy with tomorrow when Monday comes around and Tuesday comes around they're going to have something they're going to say Satan out of my way hallelujah oh don't we love it whenever the anointing is here I believe any one of these sisters could not preach in this meeting we don't even believe in women preachers A preacher that couldn't preach in this kind of anointing, he probably ain't even called in the first place. But you know well enough to know many times that's not when Satan hits you. It's not when when all this great anointing is around you, but it's when you get by yourself. It's when you get back on the job. It's when you get back to that husband that ain't right or that wife that ain't right and you say, God, what am I going to do? What am I going to do, God? I'll tell you what you're going to do. You're going to take something home with you today. My faith is stronger. My confidence in the word of God. My courage is stronger. I'm going to be a better man. I'm going to be a better woman. I'm going to be a better young person. I'm going to be a better member of my church. I'm going to be a better rep representative of the message of the hour I'm not going to be the same that I was I'm changed I'm changed I'm changed is that what you want well let's do it I said let's do it Make up your mind now. By the grace of God, when I leave here, I'm going to be a better mom, a better daddy, a brother, sister, a young person. I've got something that's changed my life. You think, Brother Ron, you think he's naive to believe we prayed for him, and I believe God did some wonderful things for our brother. Do you think he's naive enough to believe the battle is over? What do you get? Courage. Strength. 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 Hallelujah. Many of you that were prayed for, many of you that come up and God moved for you, you're not done to think, well, all my troubles are over. No, they're not over, but neither are the devil's troubles over. Oh, hallelujah. Neither are the devil's troubles over because we are leaving here Charged by the power of God. Hallelujah. I love the way the prophet said it. Your glorified body is in the building this morning. Wanting to send a charge through you. Like a battery. Sometimes we get kind of low, don't we? We go, God sends you glorified body real near. And preachers take them jumper cables and go to hooking them up. <laughs> Hallelujah. And the devil said, watch out, boys. Watch out for getting jumped off. Watch out, boys, for getting jumped off. That's what you want to leave here today with a jump. A jump, something that jump started your faith. Something that jump started your walk with God. And whenever you meet the devil, <laughs> Hallelujah! Mechanics and dynamics. Hallelujah. Yes, 
Oh, praise God. Friends, it ain't going to be long. Let me close with this. It won't be very long at all. A few more settings of the sun. Till in heaven, he will step behind the curtain, as it were. You see, Peter, James, and John, Brother Branham, all those that live in down through the ages, have never yet got to see the Lord Jesus. Remember when he was carried beyond the curtain of time? He said, I want to see Jesus. He said, can't see him yet. You see, the way he's dressed right now would be unbecoming for them to see him because he's still acting high priest. But when the last one has come in, filled with the Holy Ghost and set in the kingdom of God, I don't know how long it'll be, maybe five minutes, maybe an hour, but he will step behind the curtain as it was and will change his clothes. Yes, sir. And when he walks out, the angels look and say, Oh, today is the day. You see, whenever we meet him in the rapture, we're not seeing him as, as it were blood on his garments and a high priest. And No, but as king, he comes to claim his inheritance. And what does he do? The first thing he does is call for you to come. So when he steps out from behind the curtain, as it were, and they look, and there he's donning that robe. Don't you understand? When he changes clothes, it's a sign we're fixing to. No doubt there's people right in this building today that will not die. But you will change your mortal clothes, hallelujah, for an immortal body. Is the way before us easy? Oh no. Is all the troubles laid aside? Oh no. How will we do it? One day at a time. By the grace of God, we will get up. Oh, but what if I fall? Then you'll wipe yourself off and say, God, forgive me. I'm going to rise and try one more time, Lord. I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up. I'm pressing the battle. Hallelujah. Therefore, if you have died, what happens? If you've entered into the theophany in the sixth dimension, the theophany comes to the earth to pick up the redeemed body. And if you are here, you take the theophany, all this body, to meet the theophany. You who? You, the seed gene of God. My body don't like to go to church sometimes. My body don't like to pray. Come on. My body don't like to obey the word, but I'm doing my body the greatest favor that it could ever get. If I listen to my body, we'll be both be lost. But if I listen to my soul, and the hallelujah, my soul makes my body obey the word, one day my body will save me. Hallelujah, because I will have a body that matches my soul. That's what I want to take home. Hallelujah. You see, in the home of my dear little friend, been preachers and their wives staying with him but they're leaving today tomorrow so tomorrow or Tuesday one he'll be back by himself some of you are going back to disappointments and whatever more or what you're going to take home with you. A promise. It won't be long. 
Maybe Brother Tim will get up one morning early, go to brush his teeth, comb that black hair. And all of a sudden, in the mirror, sends his beautiful, young, sweetheart. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Going down the camp, 1964, think of it, missing people. They can't find you no more. But you're getting together with the rest of the group. <laughs> Satan laid a big trap for you, and boy, he's going to spring it on Monday. He's worked for months and months to lay that trap, and he waits for you to show up at work, and you ain't there. Wow, you got changed. You got changed. <laughs> Hallelujah. You got changed. Then what's Jesus going to say to you? Come home. Oh, glory to God. Come home, children. That's what we're waiting to hear. Come home. Imagine when the angels of God, the prophet tells us in the church age book in 1965, the streets had already been laid. The gates had already been hung. And the angels are anxiously awaiting with the anticipation of the redeemed of God. Children, what will it be like when we gather there? And the prophet said the angels will bow their heads and circle the earth as we sing the songs of redemption. Can you imagine when he steps out and they see that smile on his face? Oh, oh, happy day, happy day. See, what you doing, Jesus? I'm going to bring her back home. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Don't you love him, son? God bless you. I love you, Lord.
fullness of his love and I will praise the mighty name of Jesus praise the Lord the lifter oh praise the rock of mine and all my days
for the battles he's won in your life this weekend. I'm remembering all he's done and the victories he's won and I'll pray. praising his name. Amen. How many can say I've been changed this weekend? Amen. Hallelujah. Our God is so wonderful. Amen. Amen. I know many have to leave, Amen. but we just sure hate to leave the presence of the Lord. Amen. I pray his presence will go with each one of us. Amen. Before we leave, Brother Joe, would you just mind coming and closing the service and these meetings in prayer? Amen. If you just want to lift your hand up to the Lord and say, thank you, dear God, for being with me during this weekend. Thank you for all the things that you have done. Let's just pray together with Brother Joe and thank the Lord. Hallelujah. Father, we just bow before you right now, Lord. We want to thank you, Lord, for the supernatural. We thank you, Lord, for the visitation. We thank you for your presence, Lord, as you come by each and every service. God, we're so thankful that you moved in the heart of men. 
men who are at different places in America, different churches, but yet, Lord, through the harmony of the preaching of the gospel, Lord, the messages went right hand in hand, Lord, ministering and dealing with hearts and lives. Even to this very morning, Lord, as you dealt with Brother Donnie. Lord, we're all going home, but how are we going? Are we going to go home different? Are we going to go home healed? Are we going to go home delivered? Are we going to go home still bound by the same besetting sins and cares and strifes of this world? But Father, I believe tonight, or this morning rather, that lives have been eternally impacted by the preaching of the gospel. I believe as we heard yesterday morning that the dynamics are here to give life to the word. And I believe there's young people, there's middle-aged people, there's old people that are giving life to the word. And we have seen supernatural power come to the body of Christ. We've seen healing take place. We've seen deliverance take place. We've seen Lord struggles take place. But Father, we've seen a mighty champion stand with us, dear God. And, and I just pray right now, Father, as you go with each and every one of us. Father, may they not go home alone. May they not go home back to the their difficulties by themselves, under fear and intrepidation, worried that they got to face it all by themselves. But Father, I believe there's a champion that stood here this weekend, and that same champion is going to go with them. He's going to make a way when there seems to be no way. He's going to make Lord. He's going to bring total deliverance in the churches, in the homes, in the families, on the jobs, whatever it may be. I believe the great champion Michael has stood up for this bride, and I'm asking Father today that. This not be the last battle. This not be the last fight, God. But you continue to equip us each and every morning, Lord, when we rise and shine and we give glory to the Lord. Father, may your word just be expounded to us. Now go with each and every one, Father. As we depart this place, may we not depart your presence. God, but go with us. Give us strength for the journey. God, when the enemy would come and face us tomorrow morning, Lord, may we bring them back to these meetings this weekend. What God had done for us, Lord, point him back to the hand of the living God. So we just thank you, Lord. I thank you for every movement of the Spirit, every heart that was touched. I thank you for the spirit of the discernment that went forth and ministered to needs. I thank you that you're God. And I thank you for showing us who we are in your word, to know as we are known. And we just, Lord, as we close out these these meetings and this, this service this morning, Father, we just want to give you all the honor and all the glory and all the praise. Bless your people now, Father. Bless the ministers. Give strength back to their bodies, their families, their churches. Go with each and every one, Lord, we ask it now in Jesus' name. Thank you, each one that's taken the time, the sacrifice, financial, maybe your work time that you took off, every part. Amen. But again, we just want to thank the Lord for all he's done. So as we go, let's sing that song. Thank you, Jesus, for the grace that you've given us. Amen. And you can be dismissed. Well, thank you, Jesus. Say that I Thank you, and I'll say that.